So then where did this idea emerge from that Jesus, if, if this was the view and it was kind of the widely accepted view by Jesus' disciples and by Paul, where did this idea emerge then of the, the risen Jesus and, and there actually being a physical body? Where, how did that come into play? With that, we have to go to the texts that begin to talk about that, and I would take them pretty much in chronological order. If we start with Mark, it's chapter 16, the first eight verses. Most of us as academics are convinced that Mark ends with the women visiting the tomb and it being found empty, and they rush off and say nothing to anyone. Now, that's Mark, and it just ends that way. There is a later ending of Mark. Actually, there are three endings that are later appended to Mark. A couple of them, just even Gary Habermas would say, well, that, that's just some made-up ending. Like, they preach the everlasting gospel from east to rest and, you know, something like that. You know, you got to have some ending rather than they ran from the tomb. So Mark ended with no appearances. How could that be? How would you write a gospel and end it at the tomb? Because they're told, not by an angel, notice Mark, no earthquake, nobody's rolling back the stone, some great mighty angel coming down, no soldiers dropping dead. This is Matthew's embellishments that come next. Mark doesn't know any of this, and he's our earliest source. And what does he say? You even mentioned in your book that this idea that the body wasn't there wasn't necessarily talking about a resurrection, but the word for resurrection could be he's been lifted up and could potentially be just talking about how his body was moved. Well, not necessarily moved, not for Mark. For Mark, I think he believes we, we the technical term in Greek is apotheosis, but being lifted up to heaven and that you will see him in the Galilee. So here I would bring in the gospel of Peter. It's modeled on Mark. Uh, many of us think it's independent of Mark, but maybe knows Mark. And I've got a little passage I want to read you. Unfortunately, it breaks off. I wish it didn't. But the women found the sepulcher, very similar to Mark. And they look, and he's gone. And then the next verse, this is verse 58 of the Gospel of Peter. This is not a gospel in the New Testament. Listen to this. It, it's amazing. It was the final day of unleavened bread. Now, many don't know this, but you have Passover, Jesus, depending on whether you think he died before Passover or after, we won't get into that. But he's crucified either on or after Passover. So what do we know? We know about the Jewish festival, that Jesus eats a meal, whether it's the Passover meal or not, and then the next day he's crucified. All the accounts agree with that. Okay, then there's the seven days of unleavened bread. So after the women visit the tomb and are told he's risen and gone away, it says the final day of unleavened bread. This is a week later, a week later, eight days later. This would be the next Sunday, according to this gospel. Listen to this. We began to return home since the feast was over, but we, the 12 disciples, were weeping and sorrowful, each one, sorrowful about what had come to pass. Each departed to his home. Now, Peter supposedly is writing this. I don't know that he wrote it, but it's an tr early tradition. And I, Simon Peter, and my brother, having taken our nets, went off to the sea, and Levi was with us. And then it just breaks off. Now, think about this. This is a week later. There's, you don't leave Jerusalem until the end of the Days of Unleavened Bread. Then the feast's over. You don't leave early. So what are they doing during this eight-day period, according to this text? Weeping and sorrowful. But the women had said, go to the Galilee, and you will see him as he said. Okay, Matthew picks up on that. They go to the Galilee. They're on a mountain that Jesus told them to go to. And it sounds so much in Mark like the Mount of Transfiguration. That's Mark chapter 9, where they had a proleptic experience of the glorified Christ that we're talking about. Remember, Moses, Elijah, almost like I'm going to propel you forward to what it will be like when the kingdom of God comes. In Mark, Jesus says, some of you standing here will not die till you've seen the kingdom come with power. Next verse. And eight days later, they went on a mountain and had this vision. Matthew seems to be saying that was somehow repeated, or as my teacher Norman Perrin used to say, he taught me Mark, Mark. 
It could be that Mark 9 is a resurrection story, but it's proleptic. You know, you're going to see him as he said. Well, he said, some of you will not taste of death until you see the kingdom. Either way, what does Matthew say? The 11 disciples went back to the Galilee. Well, we're going to get to Luke next. And John, they don't go to the Galilee. They, they're even told, don't leave Jerusalem for 40 days until the next feast, which is Pentecost, 50 days later. You know, there's a real problem there. If they don't leave, they're not going to go to Galilee and see him. But in Matthew, they go to Galilee. They see him. But some doubted. Very interesting that Matthew would say that. But some doubted. So what are they seeing? Are they touching a body? Are they sitting and having a meal together? There's nothing like that reported. And then when you go to Luke, all of a sudden, we're not, nobody's going to the Galilee. They're told not to go to the Galilee. Stay there. And what do they do? Meet him, you know, eat meals with him. And as Acts says it, for 40 days, they're meeting him and seeing him regularly, eating meals with him. And what Luke is trying to do is to argue polemically against this idea that somehow resurrection was getting taken right to heaven and appearing as a glorious being where people would look up on a mountain and say, oh, that's him. You know, visionary, because if it's visionary, you could say what? What Kelsus says to Origen. Well, who cares what a bunch of crazy women saw, a bunch of deluded disciples, grief stricken? That doesn't prove resurrection. And Luke is writing later where you got to have some proof. So Jesus has to be bodily in Luke, not in Mark. And I think not even in Matthew, although Matthew does have, I think, Mary Magdalene runs into him. So it's moving in that direction. But the real witness of the 12 or the 11, as it's called in Matthew, is up in the Galilee. So we've got sightings in the Galilee. And now we have Jerusalem appearances, and there's a difference. Appearances in Jerusalem are now flesh and bones, as Jesus. I'm flesh and bones. He eats. Well, let's just be frank. If he eats, does he go to the toilet? It was a real problem in the early... Did you know the church fathers discussed this? If he's there for 40 days, did he ever go to the toilet? I mean, we laugh now, but... It would I'd be, be a long time to hold problem. it in. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying it as a point of humor. Yeah. I don't believe that earliest Christian faith was that a resuscitated corpse came out and went around eating with people for 40 days and that proved resurrection. For Paul, that wouldn't prove anything. That would prove that a guy was resuscitated and ate afterwards and taught some things. That's not the transformed cosmic Christ that he saw, you see. So now we get to your question. What is this about the empty tomb then? How does that happen? What I suggest, and Gary knows this well, we've talked about it, and he disagrees with it, is everybody's missing a single point that whoever buried Jesus, according to all our records, it's someone named Joseph of Arimathea. Now, you've got people that say, well, he probably didn't even exist or whatever. I'm going to go with all the sources that say he took charge of the burial. Explain it however you want. That's, that's the evidence of our text. I like what you said at the beginning. Let's go with what the texts say and then kind of try to figure out, is that credible or not? All of our sources have him taking care of the burial. Now, if you ask anyone, and I mean scholars too, I'm just amazed at this. I'm not going to name names, but I could, and you would know the names. They say, yeah, Joseph put him in his own tomb. And what I noticed about 20 years ago, Mark doesn't say it's his tomb. Luke doesn't say it's his tomb. John says it's not his tomb. He says near the place of crucifixion was an unused tomb, not even finished yet. And they put the body there and blocked it up against predators and according to the chronology, I understand, they're going to eat the Passover Seder that night. If you're Jewish, you understand this. He's, they're rushing because it's the high day Sabbath. It's not just Saturday Sabbath. We could get into the days of the week, but it's not important for us right now. Whatever, whether you think Thursday, Friday, whatever, there's a double festival. There's the weekly Sabbath, and then there's what's called the high Sabbath. Now, John knows this. John on chronology, I think, is superior. And what does he say? 
near the cross. It's in chapter 19. Joseph is like, you know, we're going to bury him properly. You don't just find an unused tomb and stuff him in it that doesn't even belong to you and say, okay, we buried Jesus. That's not, that's not the record. I'm going by the records we have. And the record we have in John, I think, makes sense. Then as soon as the festival is over, you come and rebury Jesus in a permanent tomb. I personally think the tomb at Talpiot has a good chance of being the tomb. But whether it is or not, that's why I said it doesn't matter. It's a tomb. Now, even, you know, Jody Magnus has worked a lot on this, and she would say also that uh, Jesus was finally, she thinks he was initially buried at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Obviously, that's empty. And either he was resurrected or he was moved. You only have two choices if a tomb is empty, right? Resurrected or moved. I'm and assuming so, it was actually the tomb. She thinks it is. I, I am not convinced yeah. that's the tomb. Shimon Gibson has a different opinion, and uh, I've got another opinion. I think it was on the Mount of Olives for different reasons, uh, because it displayed the crucifixion before all of Jerusalem. But anyway, let's leave that aside and talk about just the events. So what happens? Saturday night, you're going to go to that tomb as soon as you can, because the body's decaying. It's now been at least Two days, maybe three days, depending on, you know, what day he died, Thursday, Friday. You don't wait. Oh, well, why don't we go get the corpse tomorrow morning? This is your Rebbe. This is your teacher. This is the one you love. And the family's very interested in this because the women have to wash the body and prepare it for burial. It's not done yet. So where do we get this idea that it's Joseph's tomb? Matthew is the only one who says it, and he adds one word to Mark. Mark doesn't have this, and he put him in his own new tomb. And why does he add that? Because he thinks it fulfills a prophecy in Isaiah 53. You know Isaiah 53? If you were a Christian, you know it. Suffering servant who's buried in a rich man's tomb. And he goes, wow, if Joseph buried him, he's a rich man. It must be his tomb. Well, John can read Matthew. He doesn't say that. He says nearby was a tomb of opportunity. It's an emergency burial. Now, that doesn't do away with the empty tomb totally if you think he came out of the second tomb. But there are two tombs. There's no question in all of our records. I don't know what Gary would say about that. If you want to make Joseph just happen to have a tomb, let's say on the Mount of Olives, or if you go at the Church Holy Sepulchre or Gordon's Calvary north of the city, it's kind of silly, really. To, oh, wow, right where they happened to crucify him, that's where I have my family tomb. How convenient. It just doesn't even make sense. And why would you give Matthew priority when he's trying to fulfill a prophecy? That would be the weakest kind of thing. Now, let me read you something right out of the Bible. I think this is the earliest, most authentic account of what happened Sunday morning. And I'm going to read the latest account we have, which is kind of blows you away. Why would I go to the latest if I'm saying, let's look at the earliest? Listen to this. With this scenario in mind, what if you read these 10 verses? Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early that emergency tomb. We're reading John. While it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they laid him. Fits my scenario perfectly. She's saying, I got here as early as I could. It was still dark. I don't know about the, I bet the other woman, you know, it sounds like they did come later. We've got Peter's the Gospel of Peter says the other women came. It's a burial party, and they want to wash and anoint the body. They did not have a good weekend. Think about it. Eating the Passover Seder while you're just bawling your eyes out over your teacher being dead, it's got to be the saddest night of their lives. And that's what Peter says. We wept and mourned for eight days. They've taken him away. Who's they? The people in charge of the burial. It's pretty obvious. Joseph and the burial party took him away Saturday night. Peter comes, they don't believe it. And they run and they uh, toward the tomb. Now remember, they've been hiding out because they're afraid they're going to get arrested and killed also. And they outrun each other. 
If you remember, Peter goes, he goes in the tomb, he sees the linen clothes are lying. These are bloody clothes that they just wrapped a corpse in. You don't take those with you. And then the other disciple reached the tomb, and then he went in and he believed. Now you say, oh, see, he believed Jesus is raised. No, he believed the tomb was empty. That's what they didn't believe. What, what do you mean? Somebody took him? So they run and check. And notice, they did not yet know that he must rise from the dead. Now, John's going to lead to that in the next chapter. And that's when they go to the Galilee, remember? And they see him when they're fishing. So that fits in with Mark. But John also has some sightings in Jerusalem. He has two. Doubting Thomas in earlier, you know, over a week period. He has two other appearances. So what's happening here? If you just take those first 10 verses, I think that's what happened on Easter morning. Mary Magdalene came early. John and the beloved disciple ran and confirmed. And then the next thing is, the Lord has indeed risen. He's appeared to Peter. And that's where the synoptics go and say there were appearances in Jerusalem. It's possible that Peter had some sort of a visionary experience at that point that would equate with Paul. Paul does say he appeared first to Peter, right? Then you have the problem, which everybody throws at me. Oh, you're saying he's buried in a tomb somewhere in Jerusalem, and they know where it is, and they're going around saying he's raised from the dead. Well, first of all, they're not going around that week saying it. They're crying and weeping. But when they go to the Galilee, they have these experiences on the lake, on the shores of the lake. They begin first Peter and then the others. And Matthew records it as finally all 11 uh, on a mountain that Jesus had told them to go to, he says. So that's how I put it together. And I don't think anybody's worried about a corpse. The corpse goes back to the dust. God doesn't care about bones. You know, bones are not resurrection. But has that one whose body was left behind like old clothing, been now transformed into the cosmic power of the entire universe sitting at the right hand of God. And that's what they began to believe. And I think they were hearing voices. They were, and I don't mean that like, oh, you mean they're schizophrenic? I'm not, I'm saying what they would have reported. I, I saw him, I heard him, I encountered him. How do people receive revelations? You know, we have a whole history of people claiming visionary experiences, and they believe that a divine being or an angel has spoken to them. I know that tends to trivialize it for people, and they, oh, you're just saying it was that. I'm not actually saying what it is. I'm just saying I think the texts fall into place. And I know it's hard to imagine, but before 70 AD, I think people visited the tomb and sat in front of it. Remember, the Gospels aren't written yet. My guess would be Paul visited the tomb. I think it's the first place he'd want to go, just to sit in front of the tomb and think, wow, this flesh and blood being is now the eternal being that spoke to me. Wow. And now I'm being told that when I die, I will also be lifted up, not in my old body. He says, not the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. He says that. So you're not going to go up to heaven and be a flesh and blood person. By the way, on the toilet, this is later church fathers who say this about Mary, too, because she's ascended to heaven. They say they ate just the perfect amount of food and drink, and their body used it perfectly so they didn't have to go to the toilet. Now, <laughs> all of us would say that's silly, but for them, it wasn't silly because they can't picture Jesus. Like, after he's raised, he's not going to, you know, go to the toilet. That's like, and yet he has to be flesh and blood. So why did the flesh and blood stuff coming start coming in? Uh, first with Luke, he eats fish. He said, you got anything to eat? I'm not a ghost. Look, touch me. Here, feel those bones. Look at these wounds. John, same thing. It's apologetics. People like Celsus is later, but we know the type. They're skeptical pagan critics, and they're going, so tell me the evidence again. Some hysterical women thought they saw him at a tomb. Okay, thank you. Then what? Oh, his deluded followers thought they saw him. And you're building a religion on that. That's all you have? And it's devastating. And even the account of the 500 witnesses, it's not 500 different eyewitness accounts. It's one person saying that 500 people all saw it at once. And what does it remind you of about appearances of the Virgin? Yeah. 
I mean, it sounds like that. 500 at once. We got to picture a whole crowd of people looking up and maybe seeing and hearing something. I'm not trying to trivialize it, but we know this in the history of religions. You know, I'm a scholar of history of religions. Other religions report these things down to our own time. And I hate to put it that way because it sounds to most people like, okay, so Tabor doesn't believe anything. I'm, I'm not talking about what I believe. I'm talking about what I think the texts reveal. That's also just looking at plausibilities. It's It's things that we know other instances where followers after losing a leader or after having a prophecy right. fail oftentimes will double down and yeah. really dedicate their life to things and it's not that's not exclusive to yeah we call it so. you know the thomas kuhn thing cognitive dissonance right that's the thing that we kick around but even then remember the way they're getting affirmation that they're right is by having experiences with the one they claim is the risen lord now, you could be a perfectly good believing Christian and follow everything I just said. In fact, it would make more sense to me, logically looking at texts and say, and I believe he was in fact raised and glorified and spoke to them, right? That's your faith. It's called the Christian faith. And Paul says, if we believe that Jesus was raised, then those at his coming will also be raised in a similar way. And they're not going to come up carrying their rotted corpses. Just think about a grave. Think about cremation. Think about death at sea. If, if we can get that image in our heads, then we'll understand that resurrection is not gathering body parts and has nothing to do with such things. And they don't confirm or disconfirm in any way faith in a glorified being of somebody being transformed into this higher state. I think you're the first scholar who I've talked to who has put forth an idea that one, it's possible that we found the, the body of Jesus at Talpia, which I, I know there's some controversy surrounding that. But then at the same time, this idea that most Christians would see as absolutely devastating their faith and most atheists would seize on and be like, oh, look, there's the, the body. Therefore, this, this story is a bunch of bunk. And yet you're you're almost ticking off both crowds by saying, oh, it's quite possible that we have a physical body and that actually makes more sense within the Christian faith. So it's, it's a very interesting approach. Well, it's what Christians should believe. I mean, Paul is not writing 1 Corinthians 15 to tell you about how a corpse got resuscitated. That's not his purpose. Yeah. He's writing it to say that there's this process called metamorphosis where a dust atom, a man of dust, gets metamorphosized, if that's a word, into a life-giving spirit. He calls Jesus a life-giving spirit, meaning a self-generating divine being. And then he mm -hmm. says, and you who are with him or in him, he uses the term in him, will also have that same body in the future. And I don't think he thinks that those who follow will be greater than Jesus. He is always the first but first of many. I find it fascinating. Even as someone who doesn't believe in the Christian faith anymore, I still, I find the evolution of these stories and how they change the, the difference between the early and later Christologies. It's And it doesn't matter about Talpiot tomb or any tomb. If this is true that he was reburied and Joseph is in charge of it, then it would be on a plot of land that Joseph of Arimathea owned and uh, he provided because jesus is not from there he's from the galilee he provided jesus and his family and the movement then centers in jerusalem with a tomb doesn't they didn't throw him in a ditch you know they don't put him temporarily in a tomb and then say oh well who cares we'll just yeah. let him we'll, we'll dig a little trench here and put him there yeah uh, i think he joseph is going to honor him and those who say, oh, but Jesus wouldn't have been able to afford a, a rock-hewn tomb. That's for rich people. Well, who buried him? A rich person. So I would be looking at a rock-hewn tomb. But it doesn't have to be Talpiot. What would you say in response to someone like Bart Ehrman who would say that Jesus, if he had the death of a criminal on a cross, he wouldn't be given a proper burial, that, that it's unlikely that we would find a tomb, that we would find a corpse, that he probably was just 
thrown on the side of the road or into a, a heap with a bunch of other bodies. I just don't think the Romans would do that at that point. Uh, under Pontius Pilate, I think things are so heated. Things can erupt any time. Pilate has already had other incidents in which the emperor has not been very happy about disturbances. Some of this depends upon whether you think Jesus had lots of followers and really was a major presence that week. I personally go generally with the idea that he was very popular, that he did shut down the temple for part of a day in terms of people carrying things in and out and so forth, and was a major presence as a charismatic messianic figure of that time. If you just think he's some minor person that probably had like, what, 100 followers, then Romans might not worry about it. But, you know, Craig Evans has argued back the other way, and you can read all of the things back and forth. I think Craig does a, a good job. We also have whole encyclopedias of every account of death and burial and crucifixion to try to figure out, you know, when did they allow burial, when did they not? I'm not a fundamentalist, obviously. You heard me go through those texts in a rather critical way. But I think in general, there's a contour to the story. Jesus comes to Jerusalem at Passover week. I'll give you my my rundown like Gary did. Jesus comes to Jerusalem at Passover week. He spends a week in and out of the temple. He causes a lot of controversy and a lot of trouble. He ends up getting arrested and crucified. And Joseph of Arimathea takes charge of the burial He's on the Sanhedrin. He has connections. He can go to Herod's palace and ask for the rites of burial. He might have made an argument to Pilate, like the last thing you want to do is leave that body on the cross or discard it in a ditch nearby, because many of us honor this person and revere him. And depending on what you believe, whether Pilate's kind of like, I don't even want to do this. Do we have to do this on the Passover weekend where there could be riots and trouble and finally, you know, that trial is so difficult to sort through, like, did he really want to release him? And is it trying to just blame it on the Jews? And that's another issue. Mm. But in general, we can just say that he was arrested by Jewish enemies, taken to the Romans. The Romans at least agreed to crucify him. So I would always say the Romans killed Jesus. And Jewish blood libel and all that, I think, is theologically uh, horrible. Uh, as it was picked up later in history. Yeah. But beyond that, he's given an honorable burial, probably because of his uh, followers and the fact that people would be pretty upset at a corpse desecration of that type. Uh, you know, Pilate uh, has a history of uh, causing some disturbances by being a little heavy handed. So it's not like he's merciful. He's just afraid of Tiberius and Sejanus. That they're going to be, you know, Tiberius is on living on Capri, and Sejanus is running the empire, his Praetorian guard captain or general or whatever he is, he's in charge of it. And you don't want to deal with him. He's pretty rough. We know a lot about Sejanus. And Pilate does not want to be called in and say, oh, you caused, like, the revolt has now started in Judea over, you know, what you did to this guy, Jesus. Who is he? What is this all about? So I don't have a problem with him being uh, handed over to the Jews and to the family. I go with, that's the mainstream account that we have in all of our records. If I mentioned five records, including the Gospel of Peter, they all agree on those points. They don't agree on anything else, but they all agree that Joseph Arimathea, a sympathizer, took the body and said, let me bury it. And I think that makes sense to me. So in quick summary, we have the story of Jesus being executed, being crucified, given an emergency burial in a nearby tomb, and then the the night that the Passover ended, his body is moved to a new location. Actually, the it would be the come. next day because it's the Sabbath, too, so you can't go get it on the Sabbath. Wouldn't the night of the Sabbath at sundown be the... the yeah, the night, the... okay. When the Sabbath is over, right, they go, yeah and relocate the body. The women come the next day, the body's gone. A young man says that the body's gone, go to Galilee. People experience a, a spiritual entity, not a physical corpse. And then slowly over the decades, this story evolves as a apologetic to arguments by Celsus and others saying that these are just hysterical people that are just seeing things and right. hallucinating. But only in Luke and John. 
And John has both. It's interesting that John has both because he appends chapter 21. Chapter 20, he's imitating Luke. Like, yeah, we ate with him. We saw him. Thomas touched him. That's to say we're not hallucinating. Mm. It's real. And then in John, he makes it more up in the galley, more, yeah. I want to be conscious of your time and, and wrap up here because I know you have a lot of stuff to get to, but were there any other pieces of the puzzle that you wanted to add? I think that covers it.